In 1914, when the First World War began, the world into which modern art was born had begun to vanish. The joyful sense of possibility that was born of the machine was now cut down by other machines. This hill is called the Butte de Valancourt, and during the Battle of the Somme, tens of thousands of men died for it. The place became a symbol of obsession, first held by German machine gunners, then captured by British and Australian troops, then taken again by the Germans, and finally stormed again by the Allies. And this went on from the autumn of 1916 for two years. By the end of World War I, every yard of ground here had been dug up by high explosive, mixed with human flesh and bone and pulverized and buried again down to a depth of six feet. In such places as this, our grandfathers tasted the first terrors of the 20th century. And the life of words and images in art was changed radically and forever because our culture had now entered the age of mass-produced, industrialized death. And at first, there were no words to describe it. In 1914, not one man or woman in Europe had any real idea what total mechanized warfare would mean. Europe had been at peace for 44 years, and nobody of draft age remembered a war. Their authorities sold the war to them in a language of rhetorical cliches that descended from chivalry, the language of the public school and the officers' mess. In the trenches, millions of young Englishmen, Frenchmen and Germans found the idea that war was something between a joust and a cricket match had been wrecked by inventions which industrialised death as they had industrialised life. This was what they found and what they became. By 1916 and the summer catastrophes of the Somme battlefield, a whole generation on both sides of the trenches was becoming aware that it had been lied to. Its generals had lied about the nature and the length of the war. Its politicians had lied about its causes. Its journalists and propagandists had lied about what it was like for the troops. The flood of lies was so great that it seemed to contaminate all official language. And so a chasm opened between official language and what the young knew to be reality. The speech of the elders could not contain their experiences. America would repeat this trauma in the 60s with Vietnam. But Europe had it 50 years earlier, and the antennae of the crisis were the ones whose business was language. The writers and artists, mostly born between 1890 and 1900, who had been sucked into the vast statistics of the war. I knew a man, he was my chum, but he grew blacker every day and would not brush the flies away, nor blanch, however fierce the hum of passing shells. I used to read to rouse him random things from Dunn, but you could tell he was far gone, for he lay gaping, mackerel-eyed and stiff and senseless as a post. Even when that old poet cried, I long to talk with some old lover's ghost. He stank so badly, though we were great chums, I had to leave him. Then rats ate his thumbs. World War I destroyed an entire generation. We don't know and we can't even guess what might have been painted or written if the war had never happened. Its imagery of waste, repetition, irony, loss and pain is so built into our whole idea of modernity that we simply take it for granted.
we can't see its alternative. As for the waste of mines, we know the names of some who were killed too soon, among the painters Umberto Boccioni and Franz Marc, the sculptor Gordier Breschka, the architect Saint Elia, the poets Isaac Rosenberg and Wilfred Owen. But for every one of those whose name survives, there must have been scores and possibly hundreds of those who never simply got a chance to develop. And so, if you were to ask, where is the Picasso of England or the Ezra Pound of France, the probable answer is that they're here. Above all, what the war produced in its survivors and onlookers was a longing for a clean slate, a sense of spiritual apocalypse. In return, they would be pacifists, internationalists. They would get out of the war if possible, but to where? The closest neutral country was Switzerland. Zurich attracted every sort of intellectual refugee from Northern Europe. Great ones like Lenin and James Joyce, but a host of others. They had fled their natural homelands, but they had a cultural one, the cafe. Today, the phrase cafe intellectual is a mild, obsolete insult, but then it was not. Places like this one, the Odeon in Zurich, were cultural institutions. They were, in an almost literal sense, mediums of discourse, like magazines. People who are separated from the patterns of their society, whether by choice or not, still need a forum. They need a place where they can go to meet and drink and talk, preen themselves, or simply sit alone with a book. They say that sex is the poor man's opera, but the cafe was the opera of the dissenters. It was also the marketplace of ideas for exiles. And modernism was very much the creation of exiles, whether you're talking about Picasso, the Spaniard, or Joyce and Beckett, the Irishman. In the cafes of Europe, the intellectuals got their sense of being a class, the mandarins of change. When Stalin declared war against what he called rootless cosmopolitans in the 30s, he was, in effect, attacking the Odeons and those who sat in them. But even so, the revolution that brought him to power was partly hatched in this very room by Lenin, who was a regular at the Odeon in 1916. Among the other denizens of the Odeon were a Romanian poet named Tristan Zara, a painter named Marcel Janko, a sculptor from Alsace, Jean Arp, and a German writer named Hugo Baal. It was Baal who decided to start a cultural cabaret, a club where they could all perform and read their work and show their paintings. He rented the ground floor of a building in the Spiegelgasse and called it the Café Voltaire, and here a movement was born. Its name was Dada. A nonsense name. Dada meant yes, yes in Russian. It meant a rocking horse in Romanian. In any language, it was one of the child's first utterances. The word Dada signified the desire to go back to scratch, the impossible project of starting culture all over again from the beginning uncontaminated by the language of the elders. Marcel Yanko made theatre masks for the evenings at the Café Voltaire. Gaudy, primitive things run up with cardboard and poster paint. Hugo Baal conducted mock rituals on the café stage in costume and gibberish. The strongest influence on the Dadaists in Zurich was Futurism, 
In Italy, before the war, Marinetti had already shown how to grab an audience with manifestos and stunts. His idea of a gratuitous art at the end of history, whose full stop had been written by the machine and the Great War, was what Dada adopted along with the full range of publicity tricks. Provocation was the essential business of Dada, its claim to modernity. It was art's parody of revolution. But futurism wanted to abolish the past in the name of the machine, whereas the Dadaists wanted to produce an innocence whose metaphor was childhood. We searched for an elementary art that would, we thought, save mankind from the furious madness of these times. We wanted an anonymous and collective art. Arp offended all the conventions of sculpture by making simple jigsaw reliefs of brightly painted wood, almost toy-like. And he used chance by tearing out scraps of paper and dropping them at random onto a sheet, gluing them down in the pattern that they fell in. These simple experiments gave the lingering impression that the Dadas were against art itself. Now it's true that in the years before 1920, not only in Zurich, but also in Paris and New York, there were some very pointed jabs at the cult of art and its priests, the dealers and critics. Especially they came from Marcel Duchamp, and the best known of them was his moustache on the Mona Lisa, not only a jab at the middle-brow worship of the artist as divine creator, but also a pun on Leonardo's own homosexuality. Gioconda was another thing that um, I made here in Paris in 1919 before going back to America. And, uh, well, it was one of these gestures because I added a moustache and a goatee and also wrote underneath something very risky. The letters, pronounced as the French pronounced them, mean she's got a hot ass. Then there was Duchamp's urinal, which he exhibited as a fountain and signed R. Mutt. When I sent that urinal to be shown, is one incident. They, the jury, there was no jury, but the people who were organizing it decided it couldn't be shown, that urinal. So instead of, uh, they didn't know it was I, I was concerned with it because I didn't sign my name, as you know, the mutt name instead. So they just took the thing and threw it away above the partition. Like his bottle rack and bicycle wheel and other ready-mades, it said, in effect, that the world was so full of interesting objects that the artist need not add to them. Instead, he could just pick one, and this ironic act of choice was equivalent to creation. When Dada moved to Berlin after the end of the war, it took a very different form. In Switzerland, it had been jokey and lyrical. It exalted innocence and chance. It was an alternative to conflict, but not in post-war Berlin. To be modern here meant to be engaged in a theatre of politics in a city torn by shortages and every other kind of post-war misery as the left battled the centre and the right for possession of the streets. And it was generally felt that an artist who spent his time pulling words out of a hat at random or dropping little pieces of torn paper on a table in accordance with the laws of chance while other people were storming the Reichstag was not altogether living up to the historical possibilities of his age. In order for art to assert itself as radical, it needed to take political sides in this atmosphere. 1918 brought the end of the German monarchy and a republic was proclaimed in the city of Weimar. Between the assaults of the left and the right, the Weimar Republic lasted 15 years until Hitler finally snuffed it out. The first of its crises was a general socialist rising in November 1918, a year after the Russian Revolution. The left hoped to demolish the Prussian war machine for good, but it rolled over them. Strikes were answered by martial law, and there were many young and radical artists who went with the rebels to the left of the Republic. Now, there already was a strong threat of protest against war and authority in German art. 
It came from Expressionism, one of whose tenets was that there were no political solutions, only spiritual ones which must be made by artists. But to younger painters, the Expressionists didn't seem objective enough. To place one's sensitive ego above the whole of the world struck them as arrogant self-pity, and that was what Expressionism tended to do. When Ernst Ludwig Kirchner was in the army, he painted himself with his painting hand cut off like a mutilated saint, a man symbolically castrated by war. In fact, he had never been wounded. And so the Berlin Dadaists laughed at the inwardness of Expressionism. It was becoming official culture. They wanted a more realistic and sardonic tone of voice. They wanted an art of the billboards and the streets, not one of confession and self-searching. And they said so in their manifesto of 1918. The highest art will be the art which has been visibly shattered by the explosions of last week, which is forever trying to collect its limbs after yesterday's crash. Has Expressionism fulfilled our expectations of such an art? No, no, no. 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 Under the guise of turning inward, the Expressionists are banded together into a generation which is already looking forward to honourable mention in the histories of literature and art. Hatred of the press, hatred of advertising, hatred of sensations are typical of people who prefer their armchair to the noise of the street. The signatories of this manifesto have, under the battle cry, Dada, Dada, gathered together to put forward a new art. What then is Dadaism? The word Dada symbolises the most primitive relation to the reality of the environment. Life appears as a simultaneous muddle of noises, colours and spiritual rhythm which is taken unmodified with all the sensational screams and fevers of its reckless everyday psyche and with all its brutal reality. The man who made this collage had been in the trenches. His name was Max Ernst. The image is called the murdering aeroplane, half machine, half angel, half aggression and half, what would you say those arms suggest? Coquetry? Modesty? I don't know of another work of art that speaks so powerfully to me of the strangeness of the machine, its alien character. It's a world and a war away from Delaunay and his joyfully spinning propellers. Collage, for Ernst, was a way of rupturing one's grasp of the world. He didn't make any overtly political statements, but his work pointed to a way of making them by cutting out immediate pieces of reality and sticking them on a page. The best political collagist among the Dadaists was a woman named Hannah Hoch, whose acrid little images from the 20s are Weimar. She was never sentimental, never a party tub-thumper, and being a woman, she has regularly been written off as a minor artist. That she was not, and for a vision of a world that was at the same time clear, estranged, bleakly funny and poisoned at the root, nobody could touch her. Certain images haunted German Dadaism and were its obsessive emblems. One was the war cripples who were on every street corner. This was the body reformed by politics, half human, half machine, prosthetic man, painted here by Otto Dix, who had been through the trenches and never forgot it. This to him was the very essence of the Weimar Republic. <laughs> 
With his mechanical parts, the cripple was brother to the tailor's dummies that the Dadaists had seen in the Italian artist who also inspired surrealism, Giorgio di Chirico. Raoul Hausmann took a wooden dummy head and turned it into one of the great images of modern alienation, the spirit of our time, he called it, mechanical man complete with a tape measure for making judgments, a simpering industrial statistic. But the master of radical sourness in Berlin was George Gross. One of his friends called him a Bolshevik in painting, nauseated by painting. Actually, it was not painting, but Germany that made him sick. This one is called Republican Automatons. One cripple waves a German flag, and the other responds with a cheer from his empty head. As with politics, so with love. Weimar man, in Gross's view, has no real passions, but the system has programmed him with certain desires so that he will consume well. And thus the dummy's mechanical bride was the whore. Gross drew prostitutes with a degree of moral vindictiveness that hadn't been seen in art since the late Middle Ages. To him, the whore was the gift mansion, the poison maiden of German folklore, the bringer of syphilis and ruin. His theatre of capitalism was as clear and memorable as an old morality play. In it, everybody and everything is for sale. All human transactions, except the solidarity of workers as a class, are poisoned. The world is owned by four breeds of pig, the capitalist, the officer, the priest and the hooker, whose other form is the society wife, since in the end Gross didn't see much difference between the two. It's no use objecting that there were some kindly officers, cultivated bankers and decent women in Berlin, as pointless as telling Daumier that there were honest lawyers in France. The rage and the pain of the images simply ignores that. Gross was one of the hanging judges of art, and his verdicts echo, whether you like them or not, in every German street and cafe and beer hall, now as then. Even though the twenties have gone, and with them the shared idea that the art of opposition could have a real influence upon political events, German Dada still remains one of the moral examples of our century. For the last 30 years, the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin has stood as one of the main symbols of ideological division in Europe. On this side, they generally don't put you in jail for uttering the wrong opinions. On that side, they generally do. Over there, for the last 50 years, not one artist has been able to claim the minimum freedom which the Dadaists and the Expressionists took for granted, which is the freedom to interpose one's art between the official message and its audience. Over there, Stalin is still rolling in his sleep. But before Stalin, there was one moment in Russia when advanced art served the power of the left, not only freely, but with brilliant results. It happened between 1917 and 1925, when the promise of communism was new and the newness of art fused with it. This hope that the revolutions in art and politics would join was a modern idea, but it was also grounded in the Russia that existed before the revolution, unchanged, frozen, with a tiny elite of aristocrats and a cultivated middle class sitting on top of a vast pyramid of illiteracy. <laughs> 
One of the few ways of reaching the mass of the Russian people was through visual images. The Orthodox Church had been doing this for a thousand years with icons. Without the European avant-garde, Fauvism, Cubism, Futurism, there could have been no modern art in Russia. But before the revolution, both Moscow and St. Petersburg were truly cosmopolitan. And some of the greatest collectors in modern history, like Shukin with his Gogars and Matisses, lived in Russia. When Russian artists reacted to Marinetti and to the futurist gospel of absolute modernity, they were not responding as provincials. But the Russian economy was mainly rural, the life of its masses primitive, and machine production was so new there that the futurist myth seemed doubly wonderful to Russian painters and to poets like Alexander Shevchenko in 1913. The world has been transformed into a single, monstrous, fantastic, perpetually moving machine. And the sense of rhythm and mechanical harmony reflected in the whole of our life cannot but be echoed in our thought and in our spiritual life, in art. But it was the revolution that gave the Russian avant-garde its real vision of dynamism. Here was process and transformation, the literal renewal of history sweeping everything before it. Artists and poets saw in it the image of the future, not the real future of purges and terror in which so many of them would end, but a future that never came, one of equality, of collective energy, in which the arts would act like a transformer. And this hope reached artists everywhere, including some Russians who were working in Paris. One of them was the sculptor, Naum Garbo. Like all the rest of the population, from the very beginning of this century, we all were convinced that only a thorough revolution can change the situation which in which we lived during the uh, absolute monarchy of the Tsar. The revolution had swept away the middle class, and from now on, the only patron would be the state. The new state artists were encouraged to see themselves as social engineers. They believed that art could act as directly on politics as icons had on religion. Material was short, but at least they got ration cards and were employed on propaganda jobs. They did street theatre with parades and masks. They made propaganda trucks. They even devised an agitprop train that could travel the country, distributing leaflets, screening films, and bringing posters and drawings to the proletariat. There was a man, Lunachatsky, who was, at that time, the People's Commissar for People's Education and Enlightenment. And he said, you must all know that what we need, really, what the government, you know, need and think ought to be, is an art of five kopecks. What he meant by that, not that the art should be cheap, but he means the art which every man and workman and peasant could have bought. Of all the tendencies in Russian art, constructivism seemed closest, at least as a metaphor, to the ideals of the October Revolution. Naum Garbo explained it. Uh, it is made of nothing, and then the structure was built up. So it is a construction. But it has also an additional sense in the world, a philosophic sense, you know. We also demand that we should not make images which would increase the destructive spirit in man. It should give the man a sense of reason to live. It should be mentally constructive, not destructive. Vladimir Tatlin was one of the constructivists. The collagist Raoul Hausmann made a sort of icon of the man called Tatlin at home, with his head filled with thoughts of machinery and emblems of travel and industrial design. He wanted, he said, to combine materials like iron and glass. 
the materials of modern classicism comparable in their severity with the marble of antiquity. In 1919, two years after the revolution, the People's Commissariat for Education asked him to design a monument to the Third International. It was going to be 1,300 feet high, about 300 feet taller than the Eiffel Tower. And unlike the one in Paris, this would actually move. Inside it, three huge mobile units. The lowest, a cylinder, was the hall for the Soviet Legislative Council. It turned round once a year. Above it, a pyramid, the executive block, turning once a month. And next, another chamber, an information block which spun once a day. And finally, a half dome. All encased in the great spiral, an ancient Middle Eastern form, but in steel, on its heroic diagonal, the symbol of dynamism, of conversion of energy and of evolution from lower states to higher, dialectics in three dimensions. It couldn't be built. There wasn't enough steel in all Russia for that. So it remains one of the great hypotheses of modernism, and Tatlin was the Leonardo of the Russian Revolution. In his quest for a perfect wedding of art and technology, he repeated some of Leonardo's own projects from 400 years earlier, like the design for a flying machine, a glider, a sort of cheap airborne bicycle that every proletarian could have, which he named the Letatlin from the Russian word Letat, to fly. I have selected the flying machine as an object for artistic composition, since it is the most complicated dynamic form that can become an everyday object for the Soviet masses, an ordinary item of use. Which it wasn't and could not have been. Without a highly abstract way of thinking creatively about matter, there is no technology. Likewise, there can be no science. If this power to abstract was the common denominator of a coming society whose modernity would depend on scientific progress, then its proper art must be abstract too. Abstraction, for the Russians, was reality. The whole century, the 20th century, and the end of the last century, even the science has taken and become abstract. Abstraction in science is the main foundation of contemporary thinking of scientific thinking. And yet, in science, it has never been a separation from life. And that is what art must always remember, that our abstraction, just as in science, is natural and belonging to the development of the spirit of human being. This is our spirit. It is abstract. But it does not mean it should totally alienate it, uh, separate itself from life. On the contrary, it must go deeper in life and regard the laws of life and the laws of nature. Garbo took part in the Constructivist International. It extended from Holland to Moscow, and as one of its members, the Hungarian Laszlo Moholy Naj, remarked, constructivism is pure substance. It is the socialism of vision. In this spirit, Moholy Naj made what he called his light space modulators. Another Russian artist, El Lisitsky, also tried to marry abstract art with social use. Through the 20s, he produced a flow of what he named prone artworks, the word prone, pro unovis, meaning for a new art. They look like imaginary architecture, and so in a sense they were, because he thought of them as way stations between once rigid categories the building blocks of a new socialist Jerusalem in which all the differences between the older artistic professions would be merged in one evolved creature, the artist-engineer. Is this prone room sculpture or painting or architecture? Impossible to say. The artist-engineer must also be able to work at anything, and here Lissitsky redesigned a maths textbook for Russian elementary schools. And he did posters which were meant to communicate with the masses in a purely abstract way. How do you incite people against the white Russian army? The message is, beat the whites with the red wedge. <laughs> 
One may doubt whether this classic poster was ever much use as propaganda, but the work of Lisitsky's colleague Alexander Rodchenko was more practical in its effect. Painter, sculptor, poster maker, designer, photographer, he even designed a leather reinforced workers suit in 1925 and wore it himself. And his emblem was the camera. For the camera was objective, unsentimental. Instead of symbolist dreams, it gave the cheap, reproducible, accessible poetry of fact, of photo montage. In his posters and book covers, Rodchenko combined that with a brilliant, punchy sense of design. His montages are not so much still images as frozen cinema, like documentary film. Constructivism demanded that every work should speak plainly and not mystify anyone. This was true of architecture too, the building as declaration. This is a design for the offices of the party newspaper, Pravda. The trouble was that Lenin wasn't much interested in the avant-garde. He wanted a mass art. And after him, Stalin, the terrible simplifier, made anything that wasn't mass art a political crime. The constructivists were, from his point of view, bourgeois formalists, little specks of useless free imagination in the great ocean of his new Russia. Some he killed, some he starved, and all of them he degraded, and state art went back to its traditional job of reinforcing the narcissism of power. And so, you might think, the one brave effort to connect revolutionary art to revolutionary politics was crushed. But not quite, because although we like to think that modern art is left-wing, or at any rate liberal by nature, it certainly wasn't in Italy, where futurism provided the first official style for fascism. Mussolini was enraptured by the rhetoric of Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, the leader of the futurists. His watchword, as it was Marinetti's, was modernity. And he too loved what Marinetti loved speed, dynamism, mechanical force, war, contempt for women, the cult of masculinity, the cult of youth. In 1933, to mark his tenth year in absolute power, Mussolini held an exhibition of the fascist revolution. The catalogue proclaimed that it wanted to recall the atmosphere of the times, all fire and fever, tumultuous, lyrical, glittering, it could only take place in a style matching the artistic adventures of our time in a strictly contemporary mode. The artists had from Il Duce a clear and precise order to make something modern, full of daring, and they have faithfully obeyed his command. Montage, collage, blow-ups, cubist figures, constructivist devices, references to cinema and photography, it was all there, and very like the work of the early Russian revolutionaries. Enrico Prampolini, one of the fathers of abstract painting in Italy, did this mural of Mussolini's black shirts trampling the red flags of communism during the fascist rising of 1919. If you switch the colour of the flags and the shirts, of course, it would celebrate a communist victory over fascism. By the mid-1930s, there was little real difference between the official style of the Russian proletarian revolution, as approved by Stalin, and the official style of national socialism, as approved by Hitler. Both sides thought there was, and Hitler's architect, Albert Speer, thought that his version was the best, even though they all look much the same today. It looks like nowadays, you know, in this time, we thought there are worlds between it, because uh, the Russian in my opinion, they were crude in their architecture. I had a fine architecture, of course, but this was crude. What Speer designed for Hitler over the years had little or nothing to do with modernism except for the crucial fact that he did it in the 20th century and made it the most grandiose state architecture, at least in theory, since the time of the pyramids. Some of the ideas were actually Hitler's. In 1925, as a penniless nobody, Hitler was already making these sketches of giant domes and arches for a remade Berlin to be the capital of the world. Speer's job was to build these megalomaniac objects. This dome would have been seven times the diameter of Michelangelo's dome in St. Peter's. It would have held meetings of 130,000 party members. In such a huge building, 
the man who is the most important of the whole thing for which the building is really done uh, shrinks together to nothing. One can't see him. I haven't had any way to solve it. I put then a huge eagle with a swastika uh, behind him to say, here he is. But he wouldn't have been really visible in the grandeur he would have uh, deserved with his uh, position in the world. Speer knew that authority demanded not only size, but absolute regularity, like the rhythm of jackboots on concrete. What was the average man meant to feel in the Nuremberg Stadium? Nothing. That was no. It was not uh, not my my aim that he feels anything. I had only the aim to uh, impose the grandeur of this building to the people who are in this building. And uh, one can already read in Goethe's Voyage to Italy when he saw the Roman uh, arena in Verona. He said, if people who have different minds are in such a surrounding, pressed together, they all get unified to one mind. Mm. And I think this was the aim of those buildings and um, not what the small man will feel personally. Of all the projects that he designed for Hitler, the domes and the arches, the palaces, the stadiums and the tombs, only one is left, and this is it. This was Hitler's reviewing stand at the Zeppelin field in Nuremberg. Speer made a drawing of it to show what it would look like as a ruin in the year 3000. Bigger than the Colosseum, twice as long as the baths of Caracalla in Rome, the stone witness to the beginnings of the Third Reich and to the end of history. And so it is, but not quite as they intended it. I'm a little bit sad that there's not much left. Uh, you know, the whole uh, columns have gone. And uh, to my astonishment, um, the stone we used it was of a bad quality, so I only can say, uh, good, thank goodness that I am no more together with Hitler. He would have been very mad with me about this bad stone quality. Today, only the ruins are left. The epitaph for their builder and his client was written by W.H. Auden 40 years ago. Perfection of a kind was what he was after, and the poetry he invented was easy to understand. He knew human folly like the back of his hand, and was greatly interested in armies and fleets. When he laughed, respectable senators burst with laughter, and when he cried, the little children died in the streets. Under Speer's influence, Mussolini too switched away from modernism to a classical style of state architecture. This was his Italian forum outside Rome, and its metaphor is continuity. The past underwriting the present, the new Rome reborn from the old. Yeah. 
sole della vita nella fretta il tuo canto stilla e va If Hitler had been impressed by the ruins of Rome, Mussolini actually owned them and he got his architects to exploit them. He wanted to build La Terza Roma, a third Rome. There had been the Rome of the Caesars and the Rome of the Popes and now there would be the Rome of Fascism, halfway between St Peter's and the sea. Its head architect was called Piacentini. It was going to be finished in 1942. It wasn't, but a good deal of it is still there. This is the only piece of fascist town planning that still works. They didn't need to tear it down after the war because it was far enough outside Rome not to become a troublesome symbol. The result is a set of buildings that are the architectural equivalent of Mussolini's famous feat of getting the Italian trains to run on time. They're efficient, they're easy to clean, you just run a damp rag over them, but unfortunately, they're quite dead. When Hitler made his first state visit to Rome in the 30s, Mussolini lined the last couple of miles of railroad track coming into the Stazione Termini with stage sets, fake apartment blocks, just the front, with hundreds of Italians leaning out of the windows and cheering the Fuhrer. And this provoked one anonymous wag to write the lines which in translation run, Rome of marble, remade of cardboard. Salute the house painter who will be your next master. Well, this is Cardboard Rome. Classicism with a pastry cutter. 25 years later, a lot of Southern Californian universities were going to look just like this. Mussolini didn't like the style just because he was a bully and a braggart. He liked it because he had a jackboot in either camp, one in the myth of ancient Rome and the other one in the vision of a technocratic future. So this kind of architecture seemed just right to him, as it did to many an American corporate president and university regent after the war, like the Lincoln Center in New York. All the ingredients of an architecture of state power, as imagined by the totalitarian planners of our century, are also present in what used in the 50s to be called the architecture of democracy. What grandeur came down to was history without the trim. Not direct revival, certainly not ironic parody, but solemn parody. High-minded kitsch, the architectural equivalent of the world's hundred greatest books bound in hand-tooled Norgahai. 1950s television set renaissance. Or like the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington. This was the international power style of the 50s and 60s, as Art Deco had been to the 30s, scaleless, opaque, and its metaphors running slightly out of control. This is the scariest new monument that I know, Albany Mall, the seat of government of New York State. It was designed for one purpose and it does it very well. It expresses the centralization of power. 
And I don't imagine there's a single citizen who's ever wandered on this plaza and felt the slightest connection with the bureaucrats who live in their towers up there. The place would make Albert Speer seem delicate. Utter simplicity of meaning, no ambiguities. And what comes out is not the difference between America and Russia, but the similarities between the corporate and the bureaucratic states of mind. Any one of those buildings there you can imagine with an eagle on top, or a swastika, or a hammer and sickle. It makes very little difference to the buildings. If you forget about the projects and the manifestos and think about what it actually built, there's no doubt that our culture has its language of political power. It's not linked to any particular ideology. It's value free. It can mean anything. In the area of public building, our century has not yet managed to come up with an architecture of free will. But on the other hand, what is left of the art of dissent? Not a great deal. Only one humane political work of art in the last hundred years has achieved something like permanent fame and wide effect. It was Guernica, painted by Pablo Picasso in 1937. Its imagery was set off by an act of war, the German bombing of a Basque town during the Spanish Civil War. I say set off because although Guernica has certainly been taken as the most powerful invective against violence in modern art, it was not entirely inspired by the war. These motifs of the weeping woman, the horse and the bull had been running through Picasso's work for years before Guernica brought them together. Nor can you call this a very specific statement about politics. It's more a general meditation on suffering and its symbols are deliberately archaic, not historical. The horse, the bull, the fallen warrior, the sword. The only modern elements, apart from the late Cubist style, are the electric light and the suggestion that the horse's body is made of parallel lines of newsprint, like the newspaper in Picasso's collages a quarter of a century earlier. Otherwise, its heroic abstraction and monumentalised pain belong as much to the world of the Greek pediment as they do to the time of dive bombers and photography. Since then, full-dress revivals of the old Dada spirit of flat-out opposition to the world as it is have been the exception rather than the rule, or to be exact, ones that work convincingly as art have been the exceptions. Some have been produced by a Swiss artist, Jean Tangeli, who makes sculptures that wildly parody the rationalism of technology, of machines and the interests they serve. I'm involved by our civilization in our technical civilization and the problem of machine is the problem of an old new world. It is first of all a, a sculpture and I have tried to give him new dimension, to give him the quality of a classical sculpture and to let him in the same time to becoming a fantastic machine. And this has also the quality of, uh, of a spectacle, of a show, in the same time. It has to be, have some different faces. This, the noises and the sounds are very important and belongs to it. In art, perhaps the machine had nowhere to turn but on itself. One cold spring evening in New York in 1960, in the courtyard of the Museum of Modern Art, a small invited audience of trustees, collectors, critics and artists assembled to experience what Tangley called his homage to New York, a machine which, with a little help from its friends, succeeded in its intention of assassinating itself, a self-destroying work of art for an audience composed mainly of millionaires.
This was a long way from the original spirit of Berlin Dada in the 20s with its hope of changing society and to hell with amusing it. It was as far as the Berlin railway station of the 20s when it was one of the hubs of a shuttling, changing European avant-garde was from its form today. That particular hope of having political effect through painting or sculpture is ended. As far as today's politics is concerned, art aspires to the condition of Muzak. It provides the background hum for power. If the Third Reich had lasted until today, the young bloods in the party wouldn't be interested in old fogies like Albert Speer or Arno Brecker. They'd be queuing up to have their portraits done by Andy Warhol. It's hard to think of any work of art of which one can say, this made men more just to one another, or this saved the life of one Jew or one Vietnamese. Books, perhaps, but as far as I know, no paintings or sculptures. The difference between us and the artists in the 20s is that they thought that such a work of art could be made. Perhaps it was their naivety that they could think so. But it's our loss that we can't. Um.